Okay, this afternoon we're going to uh, start our uh, series on uh, Refueling Wisconsin. This is an eight-part uh, series. Uh, and today will be the introduction. Um, and with us today we have Amanda Mott from the State Energy Office, who's going to uh, talk to us about uh, uh, bring us up to date on the energy picture and what the uh, statewide wood energy team is all about. That Amanda. Thank you, Scott. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Amanda Mott. Uh, I am the energy, energy project specialist for the Wisconsin State Energy Office. Um, this is the first webinar in our Wisconsin Wood Energy series, and I wanted to thank you for joining us today. Um, so I know the title for this particular webinar was, in, was Introduction of Sweat and an Overview of Wood Energy. And when I was thinking about putting this presentation together, I was uh, thinking I would just give you a background, you know, on a wood, little Wood Energy 101 and talk with you about the different types of wood resources and the appliances that utilize the wood. Um, instead, I'm going to let Scott tell you about all of that next week. And today I'm going to take a little different path and talk um, with you a little bit about the following. Um, first, as we said, I'll give you an overall um, picture of Wisconsin's energy usage, um, and then talk a little bit why we believe wood energy is a valuable resource for Wisconsin, and, and I'll do that in the following context. I'm going to talk a lot about um, Wisconsin's rural energy use, which is important to this grant because we're looking at using wood in more of the, the rural areas um, of the state that don't have access to natural gas. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the propane crisis and how, how we're trying to avoid another one. And I'll talk about what the future looks like for fossil fuel prices, um, including propane, oil, and natural gas, and then give you a brief, very brief introduction to wood energy in Wisconsin. Uh, and then I'll, I'll tell you about the statewide wood energy team and what we're looking to accomplish and give you an overview of the webinar series so you know what to, um, what to look forward to in the coming weeks. So, First, as I said, I want to give you um, a pic an overall picture of the energy use in Wisconsin. And this slide shows you the different resources that we use in Wisconsin to produce heat and electricity. Uh, none of these, except for the renewable resources you see pictured, are naturally occurring in Wisconsin. Um, and so, so why do I mention this? Why is this a big deal? Well, it's very important to our economy. We send about $15 billion out of the state every year to satisfy our state's energy needs. Um, as of 2012, which is the latest uh, year that we have statistics for, the total resource energy consumption in Wisconsin was 1,571,000 ,001 trillion BTUs of energy. Um, when you break that down by fuel type, uh, the, the we use about 6.8% of electric imports. We use about 6.7% of nuclear energy. About 5.7% of that energy uses uh, renewables, and that includes um, hydroelectric, solar, biomass, biogas, um, and wind. And then comprising the larger percentage is coal, petroleum, and natural gas. Coal is about 26.3%. Petroleum is about 28.5%, and natural gas is about 26%. Um, so if we look at uh, the overall use of the winter heating fuels um, and a breakdown of those, those fuels I just mentioned, of those resources I just mentioned, um, you can see that natural gas is the most used fuel in the state. Uh, and then we'll look at this as, a, as further broken down um, to how the winter heating fuels profile has changed over time. Uh, the data on this slide is from the U.S. Census Bureau. And as you can see, this graph does a really good job of showing us the relatively stable nature of the heating fuels in the household across the state since about 2007. But even in about 1995, the percentage of households using natural gas was in the neighborhood of 65%, which is right where it is now. 
Natural gas is used in about 1.5 million Wisconsin households, comprising 64.4% of all space heating consumption. Um, that's the purpley blue color on the graph. Next uh, is electricity, which is used by about 350,000 households, and that's about 15% of, of residences in Wisconsin. Um, electricity is teal on this chart. Uh, propane is in yellow and it's used by about 262,000 households in Wisconsin, or about 11.5%. Um, heating oil is the, is the dark red color and it's used by about 65,000 households, or 2.8%. And wood is on the top, um, it's that purple cap on the top and it's used by about 106,000 households in Wisconsin, or about 4.6% of the residences. Um, some could say uh, the problem with this, or in the case of the statewide wood energy team, we look at this as an opportunity in Wisconsin. Um, it's not that everyone doesn't have access to natural gas, which um, is the most used, and it's the, hu it's the heating fuel that gives us the biggest bang for our buck. Uh, right now, natural gas is relatively inexpensive, and it's also highly efficient, but it's not available everywhere. And this next slide will show you um, show you that. So you see uh, the white areas on the map. That is uh, where everyone, where where people do not have access to natural gas. This map was developed by the Public Service Commission. It shows the natural gas service territories and the pipelines in the state. So as I said, those white areas are where natural gas is not available. Um, so now let's get into some of the fuel characteristics of, of those fossil fuels I was talking about so that you can um, just have this background and know how it compares to wood energy. Um, so, uh, but quickly before we delve into the characteristics of each fuel, um, we can easily divide the four types of winter heating fuels into two categories, those that are regulated and those that are unregulated. Uh, the regulated fuels are provided through a utility and are subject to regulation. Um, these are electricity and natural gas. The unregulated fuels are provided through privately owned retailers and are subject to different kinds of non-pricing regulation. Um, and, but that regulation is, is much less than for those regulated electricity and natural gas. Um, these are propane and heating oil. Whether a fuel is regulated or unregulated is, is very important. Um, if, you, if you can't afford to pay your natural gas or electricity bill, you're not in danger of losing your heat uh, because those fuels are regulated. There is a winter moratorium for customers um, in Wisconsin with counts in good standing on November 1st, and that means that you, you cannot lose your heat um, during the winter months. Also, the prices of these fuels are regulated by the Public Service Commission, so you won't be subject to a super high price spike. However, with heating oil and propane and, and wood can fall into this category, customers don't have these consumer protections, which is why part of why the propane crisis happened last year. Um, and the potential to lose the ability to heat your home in Wisconsin in the winter is very real, as we definitely recognized during the propane crisis last year. So now let's get more into the fuel characteristics, as I mentioned, and let's first look at the unregulated fuels. Um, propane is generally used by folks in areas where natural gas is not available, and it's also largely used by farmers for crop drying applications. Uh, propane is a fossil fuel with rev relatively low emissions. It's a co-product of the natural gas and petroleum production process. Um, and it's an unregulated fuel, as I mentioned. It's sold by private industry, um, and it's very subject to the, to the commodities market. Um, historically, the price of propane tracks the petroleum market prices, but as natural gas prices have dropped, the price of propane has begun to track closer to natural gas. Um, propane tanks are subject to regulation in Wisconsin, and those govern the safety and the storage of petroleum products. Uh, Heating oil is, is the other unregulated fuel that we're going to talk about right here. Um, it's a petroleum distillate. It's differentiated from diesel fuel primarily by its sulfur content. Um, of the 42 gallons of crude oil in each barrel, 
uh, approximately 11 gallons of distillate are produced and about 9 gallons of diesel fuel and only 2 of heating oil. Uh, because diesel fuel requires additional processing to remove sulfur, it's often more costly to produce than heating oil, which gives it the higher per, price, per gallon price. Uh, the need for heating oil is definitely seasonal, and when crude oil prices are stable, home heating oil prices tend to gradually rise in the winter months when demand is highest. So now let's talk a little bit about the regulated fuels. Um, natural gas, as mentioned, is the most popular and the least expensive fuel for space heating in Wisconsin. It's a domestic uh, fuel it's produced in the U.S. Um, it's a fossil fuel that has fewer emissions than heating oil and propane. It's also a regulated fuel and is sold by the utilities. And although the price charged by the utilities is regulated by the Public Service Commission, uh, the price the utilities pay for fuel is based on long-term contracts in the commodities, commodities market. So you can see some fluctuations uh, with natural gas prices. Electricity is used by about 15% of Wisconsinites for heating. It's available across the state. Um, it's the most expensive fuel for space heating. Most often, electric heat is seen in multifamily buildings, such as apartments with smaller square footage. Uh, seasonal consumption is more apparent in the summer with cooling demand. Um, so now that we know a, a little bit about the different fuels, let's, let's take a look at the prices. Um, so here's what the winter fuel prices look like in Wisconsin as of Monday, February 16th, uh, 2015. This chart is nice because it shows you the price per unit and the price per MMBTU. Uh, you can also see the estimated cost per season. In this case, uh, winter is defined as October through March. And let me tell you, I'm ready for it to be October through February. Um, so if we we look at the, the this graph here, it shows you what Wisconsin fuel prices look like when we do the head-to-head -head comparison on the prices of the different fuels. Um, this graph is only looking at the price per million BPU instead of the price per unit. Um, you can see that the heating oil and propane prices are um, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, heating oil and propane prices are the averages um, that are gathered weekly from October to March by the, the State Energy Office, and then monthly from April to September. Uh, the, there are 15 heating oil dealers and 23 propane retailers that are surveyed in Wisconsin to get these prices. Uh, the natural gas and electricity price data are from the Class A IOUs in Wisconsin are pulled directly from the utility or from documents that are submitted to the Public Service Commission. Um, this data is all posted on the State Energy Office website weekly in the winter months, or in the winter, and monthly in the summer. So um, you can see on this chart where the propane prices spiked last season. And um, in this next chart, now we're going to look at how wood pellets and wood chips um, play into the pricing mix. Uh, I'm not going to talk about cordwood here, but, but that is also an important energy source that we're looking at with this grant. So this graph, again, shows um, how wood energy plays into the mix. Uh, the two black dotted lines show that. Wood pellets are on the top, there's a top black dotted line, and, and wood chips are on the bottom. Um, wood chips are about $9.45 per MMPTU, while wood pellets are at about $15.42 per MMPTU here. Uh, what's important to understand from this graph is that generally the price of natural gas trumps all other fuels. Um, and if you don't have natural gas, propane is, is price-wise the most comparable. Um, so if the prices for electricity, heating oil, and wood are relatively stable, what caused the fluctuations in price for propane last year? Um, in order to understand that, we need to understand what the primary ingredients uh, for the pricing recipe are. Those are uh, supply and demand, 
seasonality and regulation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. Uh, first, let's look at supply and demand. Uh, the, the relationship between supply and demand is directly linked to the price. The more supply and confidence in the supply, uh, the lower the price. And the lower the supply and the higher the demand, the higher the price. That's, that's basic Econ 101. That's about as, as far as my uh, Econ training went. And so I have to, to thank Holly O'Higgins um, in our office who put this information, a lot of this information together. Um, so um, in order to see, for customers to see prices that are stable, supply and demand need to be balanced. Um, we, we experienced what happens when these variables are out of balance last year with the propane prices. Um, in short, we had too little supply to meet the demand, and the price reflected that disparity. Um, and, and when, as I said, when the supply and demand get out of balance, we have price spikes. So last year, we had propane gas selling at $4.85 per gallon compared to $1.81 per gallon this year in the middle of the heating season. Um, on the supply side of the equation, we have supply variables that include uh, the production of fuel, the delivery of fuel, and the storage of fuel. On the demand side, we have variables that include weather, exports, um, and for LP, uh, agricultural consumption. So what was it uh, that skewed the supply and demand balance last year? As demand climbed in late 2013 and inventories and temperatures dropped, the pricing picture that was already looking bleak for the Midwest got worse. And we saw disruptions in the service to the propane terminals exacerbating the already short supply of propane. Um, so let's take a step back for a second to understand that the upper Midwest is supplied with propane uh, by pipelines flowing from Conway, Kansas, also from the Cochin pipeline coming from coming south from Canada, and from rail deliveries. So after the harvest, the agricultural harvest last year, logistical problems prevented the region, region from fully replenishing inventories before the onset of winter. Um, we had a very late harvest, and um, it inc included a really high demand for propane later in the season, um, and it kind of coincided with the increased cold temperatures and the increased demand for propane in residential usage. Um, there were also rail transportation disruptions uh, due to weather and other factors. And from November 27th of uh, 2013 to December 20th of 2013, the imports of propane from Canada through the Cochin Pipeline were, were halted for propane for, for pipeline maintenance. Um, they were preparing for the reversal of the pipeline in the middle of the heating season, which which was kind of um, kind of bold, I think, in there for them. So the Cochin pipeline was used to import propane from Western Canada through the Midwest, and it provided about 40 percent of Minnesota's propane needs and impacted supply of largely across the Midwest. After it reopened in December, the Cochin Pipeline imported 50,000 barrels per day of propane. So as a, as a side note, um, Kinder Morgan, uh, who runs the pipeline, shut down the pipeline in late 2013, um, as I said, to provide maintenance for, for April reversal of the pipeline. So not only did they shut it down, that maintenance was was in order to reverse the pipeline in April. So this year, we're no longer getting that supply from the Cochin pipeline. So instead of um, bringing propane to the U.S., it now carries light petroleum condensate to Canada as a dilutant for the Canadian petroleum industry, or, or better known as, as the tar sands. So now the reverse pipeline carries 95,000 barrels per day of condensate up to Canada rather than bringing that 50,000 barrels per day into Wisconsin and the Midwest for propane use. So the loss of the, pro the Cochin Pipeline will have a lasting price impact um, on the future of propane. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
uh, when, when we look into the crystal ball. But you can see how all these factors helped to unbalance the, the propane supply and demand equation last year. <coughs> so now let's look at the second factor, uh, seasonality. Uh, overall, seasonality is pretty basic. The demand for space heating fuels goes up when it's cold. And um, the simple fact is what drives demand for fuels at different levels at different times of the year. It's all depending on the weather. So you can see from this graph that residential consumption follows the weather. The blue bars uh, here represent the statewide average population weighted heating degree days. Um, if you don't know what heating degree days are, as I didn't until we got into this propane crisis, um, they're measurements of the outdoor air temperature and are defined as deviations below 65 degrees. So for example, a mean daily temperature of 40 degrees would be 25 heating degree days. The more heating degree days, the colder the weather. The taller the blue bar, the colder the weather. The blue line shows the deliveries of propane into the state from all prime suppliers, the folks that sell propane to the retailers. You can see the seasonal fluctuation pretty easily. Um, seasonality also calls into play variables that fluctuate from year to year. For example, as I mentioned last year, or at the end of 2013, we saw a lot of agriculture used for propane to dry corn because it was a very wet fall with a very late harvest. This usage is largely unpredictable and it impacts demand. Um, so now let's look at the third ingredient in the pricing recipe, um, regulation. So um, part of the reason we saw such a dramatic spike in the propane price is because there's not much protection um, for the customers from market volatility for propane. It's a, not a regulated fuel, and so the price spikes that we saw for customers were largely market driven. Uh, because natural gas, is, as I mentioned, is a regulated fuel, the price increases that um, there was a slight increase in natural gas prices that customers saw last year. Those were mitigated by the long-term planning efforts that I mentioned earlier. Um, the contracts the utilities um, are required to be in under, under law and by the fact that the spot market purchases that the utilities had to make to keep up supply represent a very fairly small percentage of the overall supply used to meet uh, the natural gas customer demand. So the price increases there were less dramatic. Um, another piece of consideration um, for someone who's looking at data analysis um, is, is the simple fact that for the most part the available data sets around propane and the other run regulated fields are national and not regional. Um, although people looking at data like Holly have access to localized pricing data from the fuel survey, there's a lot of data around propane and heating oil that would be very useful but is not available because these fuels are unregulated. Um, data by county, type of customer, and storage inventory, for example, are not as available. This, um, this information would make targeted efforts around weatherization, um, summer fills for propane customers, or fuel switching a little less challenging. So, so what did um, the state do in response to this, this propane crisis? Um, let's, let's take a look at at the state's um, efforts to mitigate the price spikes that we saw um, last season. So um, following the propane crisis, well, and during the propane crisis, we did, we did quite a bit of work. The public agencies and private industry worked in, and they're still working together to create an environment to plan for and anticipate changes in the propane market. As part of the, the Midwestern effort headed up by the NGA, um, which I think um, until recently was chaired by Governor Walker, I know that the change occurs around this time of, of the new head of the NGA, um, but an effort between the NGA chair, Governor Walker, and the Propane Gas Association allowed the state to reach out to retailers and encourage them to set up customer contracts early and lock in lower prices. Um, and they also encouraged those customers to fill their propane tanks during the summer so they weren't waiting until the last minute and it got cold outside to fill their tanks. Um, so this, this effort has been incredibly successful. Uh, the, 
the people that run the Wisconsin Home Energy Assistance Program, or WEAP as it's referred to, have set money aside to fund a summer fill program during during the upcoming summer. Um, this is this is a huge accomplishment because um, last year we were trying the heating wheat program gets their money from federal dollars, and we were trying to convince the feds to allow us to do these summer propane fills last year, um, and they were very hesitant to do so to give us money in advance to do this. But because it was so successful, um, we're setting money aside uh, to do that in the future. So if you're interested in learning at all about that, that WEAP effort, you can contact um, staff at the State Energy Office or the Division of Energy Services or, or send an email to heat at wisconsin.gov. Um, private industry has also been working hard to increase um, storage and supply infrastructure. Uh, a good example of this is, is the new rail facility that was built um, in Hickston by CHS. At the retail level, price locking protects the capital interests of the retailers, and the off-season fills, called the summer build, protects against market shocks at the secondary retailer and tertiary consumer levels. Um, so not only do summer fills usually cost less, they also build allocation into the pipeline, um, meaning that the off-season purchases by retailers count toward the ability to reserve volumes of fuel during the season. Some retailers replace 500-gallon tanks on customer properties with 1,000-gallon tanks as well and encourage summer fills to protect against the fuel rush when the temperature started dropping. So lots of efforts have been taken by the state um, to help the propane industry. Um, so you might, might be wondering, you know, why I'm talking all about this when we're looking at a statewide energy team. So let's talk a little bit about the role of, of biomass as a thermal energy source for residential customers in Wisconsin. And as I said before, um, Scott will get into the deeper details next week. Um, so as you know, the considerations around biomass touch a wide variety of topics, including fuel switching, primary versus secondary thermal source, cost, emissions, and resource proximity and availability. Um, so, so the question remains, how do we incorporate biomass as a thermal space heating fuel into the mix to increase renewable thermal energy in the state from, or in the Midwest in general, from 3% to 15%? That's one of the goals of um, heating the Midwest, which you'll hear more about in some of these presentations as well, and, and one of our partners in the statewide wood energy team. So let's look at some of the pros and some of the cons of using biomass. Um, if we consider the current economy, it becomes apparent that increasing the volume of biomass for thermal applications is largely ambitious. Um, we need to determine how we will measure our success. Will it be by the overall percentage of the market share um, that we can get for biomass or by displacement of fossil fuels in statistically significant volumes? Increasing the use of biomass will definitely be challenging, but that's why we put this team, team together and are making this effort. We want to increase um, the use of biomass as a thermal fuel, and, and we're trying to look at ways to do this. So I promised that I would give a little projection about um, what the future of these heating prices look like. Um, but let me first put in a disclaimer that these are forecasts and predictions, um, and, and they will most likely be wrong, but the question is just how wrong. Um, we're going to do our best to just be a little bit wrong. Uh, so natural gas prices are expected to be stable through the end of 2015. Heating oil prices are, are truly market dependent, but are expected to stay low as the price for oil is not expected to go above the $68 per barrel range. Mm -hmm. um, propane prices are expected to stay low as well due to um, robust propane stocks nationwide. We aren't facing a shortage as last year, and it, I guess the Cushing pipeline reversal hasn't proven yet to be such um, a barrier for us. Um, 
And electricity prices are expected to continue a steady climb, with the Midwest being the largest, um, about 2.6% increase nationwide in the residential sector. So again, I know you wanted to hear more about wood energy, but I'm preparing you for the next week's um, <coughs> webinars, which will delve into the types of wood energy, uh, the appliances that utilize wood resources to make energy, and wood energy pricing. So now, why are, why are we talking about wood energy, and what is the statewide wood energy team? Um, so thank, I just want to thank the U.S. Forest Service for providing us with this opportunity. Um, we were awarded, the State Energy Office was awarded $250,000 from the U.S. Forest Service um, Department of Agriculture. Um, so we, we were, um, provided this money to make up a team uh, to promote wood energy in the state. Uh, the team is made up of private and public stakeholders. Um, it aims to expand markets that convert woody biomass into energy, advance installation of commercially viable wood energy systems in public and private facilities, to support wildfire mitigation, forest restoration, urban wood utilization, and other forest management goals that utilize Wisconsin's woody biomass resource, which we have a large um, amount of. Over the next three years, this is a three-year grant, the statewide wood energy team will look closely, uh, will work closely with the U.S. Forest Service to enhance woody biomass education, outreach, and project development in the state. Uh, the project will focus on utilizing materials from the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest as well as urban wood waste, um, including wood impacted by emerald ash borer. So the Wisconsin sweat goal is to implement 20 to 30 small-scale wood energy projects and four large-scale or cluster projects during the three-year period. Um, the team is made up of, of the members that you see listed here on the screen who also committed a large amount of match or in-kind resources to participate in the team, which increased um, the amount of, of money that we have for this grant to over $500,000. Um, so what, what are we looking to accomplish? Um, the state wide wood energy team will work to conduct significant as I said, outreach, education, and project feasibility assessments. Um, we're also doing some train the trainer webinars. Uh, that's what you're on right now. And um, we're hoping that people can take the information that they've learned in these webinars and uh, provide this information to, to other people in their communities um, and spread the word. Uh, we hope to have some residential and small commercial heating um, with wood workshops and also some large commercial and industrial users workshops. Uh, we're, we're providing marketing and technical assistance for the wood, wood pellet industry um, through this grant. Um, and Wisconsin, we have developed a Wisconsin wood energy website, which you can see the the link to up on the screen. It's www.wisconsinwoodenergy.org. Um, you can find a lot of information on that website, including um, profiles of and case studies of projects that are already implemented. We have some funding resources on there. We have various calculators to help you um, figure out if you would be a good candidate for a wood energy project and also contact information for Scott Sanford who can help you um, look into this in greater detail. Um, the DNR is uh, producing a woody biomass supplier and end user database. Um, as I said, we're looking at urban wood um, energy development. Um, cluster project development, large user development. Um, Scott will also be focusing on some greenhouse wood energy development. And um, we have a feasibility study grant program. So those people who seek to do a pre-feasibility study with us, if it looks promising for that project, we will um, consider them uh, for the ability to look further and do a fuller, larger feasibility study, which the U.S. Forest Service will be helping us with. 
Um, the ultimate goal is to really create a sustainable model for increasing wood energy use in Wisconsin. So we have um, spit not off a lot, a large amount um, to chew for these efforts, uh, but we really hope that um, we will be successful and that you can help us to get there. So, so what else are you going to learn in this webinar series? Um, it's going to provide information on using a wood and as using wood energy as an alternative to those fossil fuels that I recently talked about, propane, um, gas, fuel oil, or, or electricity um, for heating and process heat. The webinar topics are listed on the screen, but they include um, how wood energy compares to fossil fuels, wood fuel types, and consumption appliances, the economics and case studies of um, wood combustion systems, feasibility assessment tools, financing options, and wood fuel supply and distribution, and also cluster development and district heating. Um, so if you know people that might be interested in, in these topics, please, please spread the word for us. And I really um, want to thank you for, for listening today. And um, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me at Amanda dot mot at wisconsin dot gov or my phone number is 608-261-8404. Again, thank you for your time and um, hopefully you'll join us next week for Scott's presentation. Thank you, Amanda. Well, that wraps it up for today and uh, we will be posting this uh, video link and uh, so you can uh, watch it as many times as you want. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, see you next week. Thank you.